Bob Tosky, and I'm standing behind this tree, which doesn't look too friendly. I made a poor golf shot, and now I must figure a way to get back to the playing area, or hopefully to the green. My experience in playing these shots has helped me to get out of trouble many times. To share this experience and help you learn how to escape from these areas is the Houdini of our Golf Digest schools, my good friend and head instructor, Hank Johnson. Thanks, Bob. In today's lesson, we're going to be working in five major categories. Number one, your priorities and goals for the particular shot that you're about to play. Number two, ball flight. Are there any special considerations related to the shape of the shot? Number three, the lie of the golf ball. You must pay particular attention to the conditions in which the golf ball is sitting because they really dictate your options. Number four, stance and balance. In playing a trouble shot, sometimes you're required to stand in a fairly awkward position, so you have to be very careful to maintain your balance during the swing. And number five, special situations. Is the swing restricted by a tree? Are there any other special considerations that you need to pay particular attention to? We're going to be in some places today on the golf course that none of us want to be, so let's get to work. Let's talk specifically about priorities and goals. Bob referred to me as the Houdini of the golf schools. And I think we can all agree that the great Houdini's number one priority would have been to escape and minimize the damage. And that's the philosophy you want to use when you're faced with a trouble shot. To salvage the most reasonable score possible given your skill level. And you have to make a very specific plan. A plan related to how you want to make these things happen. What do you want the ball to do? And where do you want the ball to land? And what do you want the ball to do after it lands? Let's talk for a minute about the specific things that influence the ball's reaction in trouble situations. The single greatest influence on the shape of your shot once it's underway is the spin that the club face imparts to the ball. The angle at which the club is moving, coupled with the tilt or loft in the club face, imparts backspin to the ball and influences the trajectory of the shot. If there's a deviation between the club face alignment and the path of the club, side spin will occur and the ball will curve. If the club face is looking to the left of the path on which it's traveling, the ball will receive counterclockwise spin and hook once it's underway. If the club face is looking to the right of the path on which the club head is moving, clockwise spin will be imparted to the ball and the ball will curve to the right once it's underway. Now those are the things that the swing and the club can make the ball do. But we need to look at the lie of the golf ball because that determines what we can or can't realistically expect to do. You know, in any set of circumstances, the lie of the golf ball can dramatically affect the options that are realistically available to you. Now, we're here in the edge of the rough, 150 yards from the flagstick, with a bunker between the ball's location and the green. And what I'd like to do is to take my 150-yard club, which is my six iron, and hit the ball right on the green. And from this lie, I can do that. I can just play my normal shot because the ball is sitting very nicely in the grass. 
and I can use my normal swing from my normal position and play the ball right onto the green just as I would if the ball was in the fairway. This lies a different story altogether. It's not realistic for me to expect to move the ball 150 yards when it's sitting down that deeply in the grass. So I've got to change my strategy completely. And one of the first things I'm going to change is the club that I'll use because I'll obviously need a more lofted club like my sand iron. I'm also going to change the direction in which I aim because my major concern now is to avoid the bunker that's directly in front of me between my ball and the flagstick. And I'm going to turn and aim out into the fairway to escape this trouble and put myself back into a position to salvage my best score. I've chosen a sand iron. I'm going to play the ball slightly more back in my stance and that'll create a more vertical swing and allow me to loft the ball out into the fairway. Now from there, it would be possible for me to play the ball back onto the green and still salvage a reasonable score. Remember, the lie dictates the options that are available to you. And these are only two examples of the different lies that you might experience. Let's talk about some more. Now here's an interesting situation. We have the same shot as before, but now the ball is sitting in a collection of grass clippings, which is a very soft and loose substance. And it really requires us to be very creative so that the club doesn't get too low and get tangled up in all of that loose grass. Now I'm going to play a six iron for this 150 yard shot. That's my normal club selection. But I'm gonna make a couple of changes in terms of my address position. One of the things I'm gonna do is to choke down on the club to make sure that the club only gets as low as the bottom edge of the ball. And in order to make the swing more level and more sweeping, I'm going to play the ball slightly forward in my stance in relationship to my normal ball position. Grip down on the club, play the ball slightly more forward in the stance, and then just make your normal swing. Now you'll have to base your club selection on your skill level. My 150 yard club is a six iron. Yours may be a little longer. You know, with those mounds and bunkers up in front of the green, what I'd like to do here is to play a high soft shot that would stop quickly when it lands. Unfortunately, I don't have a lie that will allow me to do that realistically. My ball has come to rest on a bare piece of ground and it's gonna be very difficult for me to play a high shot from that lie. The thing that I have to do to keep the lie from interfering is to play the ball more back in my stance and allow the club to strike the ball a more downward blow. And those two things are gonna produce a lower ball flight. So what I'm gonna to have to do is to aim to the right of the flag and let the ball land short of the green and bounce up onto the putting surface. I'm gonna use my normal grip, play the ball back in my stance allow the club to strike down, producing a lower than normal trajectory. Allowing the ball to land short of the green and run up on the putting surface. And remember, that's not the shot that I would have selected from a perfect lie. From a good lie, I would have been able to hit the ball up into the air softly over the bunkers and stop it near the flag. I let the lie dictate the shot as it must played the ball back in my stance, played a lower, more running type of shot, and now I'm safely on the right side of the green with a chance to two-putt for my par. Now keep in mind that to make realistic goals, you have to let the lie dictate your shot selection. Well, I've gotten a little unlucky this time. My ball's ended up in a divot, and I have to be realistic in terms of expecting uh, myself to accomplish my normal shot. I'm going to have to to make a different plan, what I'd like to do is to take an eight iron and knock the ball right up on the green. And if I had a good fairway lie, I'd do that. But with the ball in a divot, I'm gonna change to a more lofted club, my pitching wedge, so that I'll be sure to get the ball up quickly enough for the front end of the divot not to interfere with the shot. Now I'm lucky in one respect because this divot is running in the same direction that I wanna play. And the ball will normally come out in the direction that the old divot's running. So I did at least get one break. Now again, I'm gonna play the ball back in my stance to encourage a little bit more downward blow. 
and I'm going to pick a target area that's well short of the green so I don't put any pressure on myself at all and I'm going to let the loft in this pitching wedge put the ball up in the air and put it right up in front of the green. Now that's not the shot I would have selected from a good lie, but from there I've got a chance to pitch the ball on the green and still salvage par. Remember, you must be realistic. There are many other trouble situations that we can talk about, but keep in mind your number one priority, and that's to minimize the damage. Uneven lies can be a very special problem because the stance is usually awkward and one of the number one goals is to maintain your balance during the swing. On this uphill lie, in order to successfully play the shot, I need to position myself so that the tilt in my shoulders matches the slope that the ball is sitting on. That's going to put the weight on my downhill leg, but that will make it easier for me to keep my balance during the swing. One thing you need to remember to do for all uneven lies is to make a practice swing beside the ball and watch to see where the club brushes the ground. That'll take, tell you the proper ball position for the shot that you're about to play. Now, as I made that rehearsal swing, the club struck the ground just about in the center of my stance, so for this shot, that would be the correct ball position. As I tilt my shoulders to match the slope, I'm actually aiming more up into the air, so the shot that I hit is going to go higher than this club would normally produce. I may have to take one or maybe even two more clubs for a particular distance. Let's see how this goes. I'm going to balance myself on the downhill leg, make my shoulders match the slope, position the golf ball where my practice swing told me it should go, and try to make as nearly as I can my normal swing. Remember, uneven lies involve adjustments in your setup. And the number one priority is to be standing in a position that allows you to keep your balance during the swing. In this situation, the ball is above my feet on the hillside. I'm going to have to make some pre-swing adjustments because of that fact. The ball, in fact, is closer to me. And I'll have to choke down on the club so there'll be room for my swing. The swing will be more tilted more around my body and that'll have the effect of making the club aim more to the left at impact so I'll be aiming more to the right than I would from a level lie for this same shot and remember that vital practice swing to give you the ball position now this time it looks like the club is going to strike the ground just forward of the center of my stance so I'm going to be using a ball position just a little bit forward of the center of my body choke down on the club aim more to the right than normal for this same shot from a level lie slightly forward of the center of my stance with the ball position and stay in balance during the swing trouble shots even from this type of lie can be fairly easy if you do a good job of planning let's watch Bob Toski hit this same type shot with the ball above his feet Bob rehearses the swing that he wants to make. And since the ball, in effect, is closer to him, he chokes down on the club. These shots have a tendency to go more to the left, so Bob will be aiming to the right of his normal alignment. Now, this is one of the more difficult uneven lies, a side hill lie with the ball below your feet. And in effect, this ball is farther away from me than it would be on a level lie. So I have to compensate for that by bending over more. And that also will give me the advantage of making a more vertical swing to keep the club from striking the turf behind the ball. As I make the club swing on a more vertical plane, I run the risk of the shot curving to the right as it comes off the club face, so I will aim a little bit more left than I normally would. And remember the practice swing. The practice swing tells you if you're going to be able to stay in balance and also where the club is most likely to first strike the ground. Again, I've got a ball position indicated by my practice swing that's approximately in the center of my body. So I'm going to bend more to be able to reach the ball comfortably. I'm going to make a more vertical swing than normal 
And I'm going to start with a name that's a little more left than I would normally use from a level lie. Remember, the number one priority in all uneven lies is to keep your balance because that will allow you to escape and minimize the damage. Now let's watch Bob Toski in a similar situation to accommodate the fact that Bob has a lie with the ball below his feet. He's going to bend more from the waist and because this line normally makes the ball go more to the right, he's going to aim to the left of where he would aim for a normal shot. Many players consider the downhill lie the toughest of all. But if you do a good job of planning and get yourself in the proper position from which to swing, it'll be a lot easier. Now again, you have to stay in balance, and that means balancing the weight on the downhill leg. You'll also want to get your shoulders to match the slope so that when you swing, the club will follow the slope. The fear that most players have is not having the ability to get the ball up into the air from this type of lie. And the way to solve that problem is to take a club with enough loft in the face, even if it won't reach the target. You want to remember to make the practice swing to identify the ball position. And in this situation, the club seems to be striking the ground more back toward my, my rear foot. So I'm going to use a ball position a little behind the center of my stance. Again, I'm going to balance myself on my downhill leg, try to stand so that my shoulders match the slope. The ball will be played slightly behind the center of my stance, and I'm going to stay in balance and just let the club follow the slope right down through the ball. Remember, the key to playing from any of the uneven lies is to get into a good starting position that lets you stay in balance throughout the swing. Occasionally you might find yourself in a situation where your swing is restricted by an obstacle like this tree. But if you make a good plan, sometimes the solution can be very simple. In my normal stance and with a normal swing, my follow through would strike the tree and I would run the risk of damaging my club. But I can solve that problem by playing the ball back outside the right side of my body. This is going to make the swing so much downward that the club striking the turf will interrupt the follow through and minimize the risk of striking the tree. If the tree restricts your backswing, sometimes the same principle will work. A normal stance and a normal swing would cause the backswing to strike the tree, but by standing more forward with the ball to the right of my body, the backswing is so vertical that it will miss the tree and allow me to play a normal shot. Remember, in minimizing the damage, sometimes the solution can be as simple as a change of the ball's position before you swing. In this situation, the tree is interfering with my stance, so I can't stand in my normal position. And I'm really in double jeopardy because I've got another tree between my golf ball and the flagstick. I'm going to have to get pretty creative. One of the ways I can handle this situation is to play the shot left-handed. And to do that, I'm going to take a 7-iron, turn the face of the club upside down so that it's resting on the toe. I'm going to use a left-handed grip and to minimize the risk of my ball striking this tree I'm going to be aiming well to the left of the flagstick. Now my objective here is just to get the ball near or on the green so that I can get it in with the next two shots. Another technique that you might consider using from this same situation is to turn your back to the target. We can still use the 7 iron and I'll let it hang out of my right hand so that it's hanging just above the ground. And the motion I'll make is the same motion that you make as you walk. Just swing your arms back and forth. 
just give the ball a little tap and hopefully it'll run right up on the side of the green. With a little practice, you can become very effective with these two shots and occasionally you'll find a place to use them. Remember, the number one priority, minimize the damage. In a fairway bunker, your two main goals are solid ball contact and enough elevation for the ball to clear the front of the bunker. Now to assure solid ball contact, work your feet in so you'll have good balance and play the ball back in your stance to encourage a more downward blow. And choke down on the club you're using and that will help guarantee that you'll strike the ball before the sand. You take care of the elevation by choosing a club with enough loft in the face to make you very comfortable with being able to get the ball over the lip of the bunker. The main key during the swing is to keep the swing very smooth and stay in balance. Let's watch Bob Toski hit a fairway bunker shot. To play this fairway bunker shot, Bob's choking down on the club, and he's positioned the ball more rearward in his stance than he would for a normal shot. He'll work hard to maintain his balance and use a smooth, full swing. Here we have the classic trouble situation. A tree between my golf ball and the target. I'm too close to try to go over the tree, and it's too low for me to try to go under it. So I've got to come up with a shot that goes around it. Now I want to start the first shot to the left of the tree, curve it back into the target to the right. And I'm going to open the face of the club a little before I grip it to put clockwise spin on the ball and create the curve. I'm going to open my stance and that lame my swing to the left of the tree and start the ball on that line. Now the main thing I have to remember is to swing along my stance line so that the ball starts left of the tree and curves back into the target to the right. Now I always look for the way to hit that shot first because a fade is normally easier to hit with control than a draw. But if you have to go to the other side of the tree, then you just reverse the process. As you grip the club, you want to turn the toe in a little bit and that'll aim the club face to the left, give the ball counterclockwise spin and create a hook. You want to close your stance and aim your body to the right of the tree and that will allow the path of your swing to start the ball to the right of the tree with the spin curving the ball back into the target from right to left. You might also want to play the ball slightly farther back in your stance to encourage a more inside backswing and downswing. Close stance, close club face, the swing going to the right of the tree. In these kinds of situations, you have to play thinking man's golf. Here's an illustration to show you what I mean. This time, the ball's behind a tree, just off the left side of the fairway. Your options would be to hit over the tree, or to hit a shot that started to the left and curved back to the right into the target, or start the ball to the right and curve it back to the left. Let's say you're too close to hit over the tree, and the situation is such that you can hit to the right and curve the ball back to the left toward the green. But what if the green's bunkered in the front, and to the left, and behind? A curve ball to the left could catch a bunker, or if it came in to the right with hook spin, it would most likely run through the green into the bunker behind. Your smart shot is to play short of the green, to the opening. But what if there's water on the right? Unless you hit a perfect curveball, it could be disastrous. In that case, what you need to do is just play the ball back into the fairway. Now that's smart golf, and that's what I mean by minimizing the damage. I hope you're going to take some key thoughts away from today's lesson. Try to be your own best friend when a poor shot lands you in trouble. 
Remember your priorities and goals, especially the first one. Minimize the damage. Consider the ball flight requirements and what your clubs can do. Be realistic about your skill level and what you can do. Remember, the lie will determine how many or how few options you'll have. Work on the basics, good stance and balance on those uphill, downhill, and side hill lies. And remember, in special trouble situations, there are logical, reasonable ways to make a great escape. Can you practice trouble shots? You certainly can, and have some fun. For example, trying to hit low-flying curveballs as though there was a tree between you and your target on the practice range. I hope your game is trouble-free, but when it's not, I'm confident now that you'll be able to handle it. Bob, that's our lesson. Not bad for no pro. Thanks, Hank. What we want you to remember is the most important objective the next time you're in trouble is to minimize the damage. When you arrive at the scene, think about what you'd like the ball to do, where it will land, and what it should do when it does land. Then think about what the lie the ball requires you to do and what your skill level will allow you to do. Remember that all these considerations we talked about, carefully thought through, will give you an opportunity to escape from the trouble and maybe even salvage par. Thanks for being with us today.